All right, welcome back everybody. And today we're gonna to be using some complex analysis to evaluate this improper integral right here. So to get started, as always, we're going to be defining for ourselves a new complex valued function. Let's call it f of z. And we're just gonna let it equal to this integrand right here, but we're going to replace all the x's with the c. So we're going to have z to the four minus z squared plus one. So we're just changing from real valued inputs to complex valued inputs. And with this function, we're going to be integrating this along a contour later on and we're going to be making use of Cauchy's residue theorem and to do so it would be nice if we know where the poles of this function are. So how do we calculate the poles of this thing? Well it's where this thing blows up to infinity and that happens when our denominator is equal to zero. So in fact our poles occur for all the z's where our z to the 4 minus z squared plus 1 is equal to zero. So the solutions to this quartic right here. And as it is, it's a little bit hard to find the zeros of this because it's a quartic, but there's actually a nice substitution we can use to turn this into a quadratic. And we're just going to be letting u be equal to z squared because in doing so, we now get a quadratic in u. So we have u squared minus u plus one being equal to zero. And from here, we can just use the quadratic formula. So minus b, well, b is negative one. So minus minus one is one, plus or minus the square root, b squared. So minus one squared, which is one, minus four ac. So we have four, a is one, c is one, and that's all divided through by 2a, but a is one, so it's just divided by two. So those are our solutions to u. And well, we can clean things up a little bit. This is, let's write it like this, one half plus or minus the inside right here, that's going to evaluate to what well, one minus four is negative three, but we have a negative inside of the square root. So let's bring up the negative and turn it into an i. So we have i times the square root of three. We still have this division by two right here. Um, so there we go. All right, so now we have the solutions for our u, but we want solutions in terms of z. So that means that our z squared must be equal to one half plus i square root of three over two, or z squared is equal to one half minus i square root of three over two. Now split it up just to make things easier later on. All right, so now what can we do? I want to turn this into a polar form because we're going to be taking the square root on both sides and it's a little bit hard doing this in rectangular form. So notice that one half, that's exactly the cosine of pi over three. And three over two, that's the sine of pi over three. So in fact, we can use Euler's formula and we have e to the i, well, pi over three. And if you expand it out and all that, this is the complex number you should get. And also the modulus is one, you can check that for yourself. But z squared is nothing other than um, e to the i pi over three. Same deal down here. We have a negative, so the conjugate of this, the complex number. So we're going to get the same thing as before, but we're just flipping the argument in here. So minus i pi over three. Okay. So button and polar form. And now all we have to do is take the square root on both sides. We have to be a little bit careful right here because we're actually gonna get two solutions because this is a quadratic. So I'm not actually gonna put this over here. So z squared is equal to e to the minus i pi over three. That way we get a bit more space down here. So for our first solution for this equation, we have z being equal to, we're just going to take this two, divide it on this exponent right here. So we're going to get e to the i pi over six. So e to the i pi over six, that's our first solution. In order to get our second solution from this right here, we're going to add two pi to this argument like so. That's going to give us a seven pi over three. Dividing by two, we're going to get seven pi over six. So z is equal to e to the i seven pi over six, but we want the principal argument so we're going to take minus i five pi over six. You can check that out for yourself. See that everything makes sense. Same deal over on this side, we're going to divide this exponent by two. So we have z being equal to e to the minus i pi over six. And adding two pi to this argument to get our second solution, that's going to be seven pi over three. Dividing it, this, dividing it by this two right here, that's seven pi over six. So z is also equal to e to the minus i seven pi over six. Taking the principal argument, that's exactly i times five pi over six. Essentially, we've gotten all these poles right here, because remember these are the solutions to this quartic, which are the poles. 
So let's actually draw this up in a bit of a complex plane. So this is our complex plane right here. Um, this is the imaginary axis and we have the real axis down here. And let's plot each of these poles. So e to the i pi over 6, that's probably somewhere over here. e to the minus i, 5 pi over 6, that's exactly um, on the opposite side. e to the minus i pi over 6 is down here. And this is on the opposite side. So we get um, a nice little rectangle that's been right here. So we know where the poles of this function are. And now it's time to establish some kind of contour to integrate this function over. And to figure out what the contour will be, we're going to take a look at our original interval. So from minus infinity to infinity. And we want to take the finite case of this actually. So from minus r to r, where r is strictly greater than one. Um, and we're going to be taking the limit as our r approaches infinity. And that's just so we can kind of visualize it on this um, diagram right here. So what does this interval look like? Well, if we pick some big enough radius r, and we go from minus r all the way up to r, this interval is the interval that we're pretty much originally integrating across, so this red interval right here. And what we want to do is we want to enclose at least one of these poles so we can use Cauchy's residue theorem. And the way to do that is just by going around and connecting it to the other side like so. So we're going from negative r to r along this path right here, and then we're gonna go along this upper arc, and we're just gonna call that path in gamma, and we'll call the whole entire contour c. So now that we've established that, we have the interval from minus r to r, and if we union this with the set gamma, like so, we're going to get our c. So our c is defined by the union of those two paths. And we can write this out a little bit. If we, if we contour integrate over c of f of z dz, we can split this up into two paths. So we have the integral from minus r to r. Now, notice that the integral from minus r to r is on the real axis. So instead of z's, we can just put x's. So f of x dx. Then we have plus the integral over gamma of f of z dz. And remember later we're going to be taking the limit as our r approaches infinity. And the reason being we want this integral to kind of turn back into our original integral right here. So if we take the limit everywhere, so limit as r approaches infinity, limit as r approaches infinity, and limit as r approaches infinity, we have that, well, this left hand side right here. So limit as r approaches infinity on the contour in square over c of f of z dz is equal to, well, if we apply the limit to this integral, we're going to get the integral from minus infinity to infinity. f of x, well, if we just plug x into here, we're going to get one over x to the four minus x squared plus one dx. So that's our original integral. And then we have this integral over gamma. But the nice thing is this thing in the limit, that's going to vanish off to zero. And that's because of Jordan's number. You can check out the proof I made for that um, up here somewhere, or the links can be in the description. But essentially, since we have a polynomial of a degree greater than two at the bottom right here, and we just have a single one up here, if you take the limit as our, our approach is infinity everywhere, um, then yeah, this thing's just going to vanish, hence the integral will vanish as well. So I'm not gonna cover the proof of that in this video, it's just gonna take too long. So essentially what we have right now is that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of one over x to the four minus x squared plus one, that's our original integral, is the same thing as this contour integral right here. So in fact, in order to evaluate this integral, we just need to figure out the value of this contour integral in the limit as our r approaches infinity. And the nice thing is, given that r is strictly greater than one, our contour right here, no matter how big it gets, it's always going to enclose those two poles right there. And as long as the two poles are um, enclosed at all times, then the value of our contour integral will be the exact same thing. So in fact, since the poles are always in that contour, we can get rid of this limit, we can disregard it. So one more thing I forgot to do is label these poles actually. So the two poles we're really interested in are these right here. So this pole right here, that's e to the i um, pi over six. And this pole right here, that's e to the, which one is it? e to the i five pi over six. So this one is e to the i five pi over six, like so. All right, now we can get rid of all of this stuff. 
Right, so to evaluate the contour interval over C of f of z dz, we can use Cauchy's residue theorem, which is uh, pretty straightforward. So this is going to be equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues inside of this contour. And since we have two poles, we're going to have two residues. So first of all, we have the residue at z being equal to this first pole right here, so e to the i pi over 6 of f of z. And then we're going to add that with the residue at the z being equal to e to the i5 pi over 6, so our second pole of our function f of z, like so. And what we can use the definition of these residues right here. Notice that these are poles of order 1 because if you differentiate this denominator right here and sub in those poles, you won't get 0. So if you use that definition, we're going to get 2 pi i times the limit as our z approaches this first pole, so e to the i pi over 6, of we're going to have z minus our pole times our function f of z. So we're going, so I'll just write it like this, z minus e to the i pi over 6 times our function, so that's just a division by z to the 4 minus z squared plus 1, like so. That's our first limit done, and then we're going to add that with the second residue, so the limit as z approaches e to the i 5 pi over 6 of, well, almost the same thing. We're just going to have the z to the minus e, z minus e to the i 5 pi over 6 instead over our function, which is z to the 4 minus z squared plus 1. And that's what we have to compute next. So let's keep going. Let's rub all this stuff out. Notice one thing about these two limits right here. If we plug one of these poles, for example, into our z, we're going to get a zero at the top right here. But since these poles are solutions to this um, quartic at the bottom right here, same with this pole over here, we're also going to get a zero on the denominator. So in fact, if we directly plug z equals to one of these poles into this expression right here, we're going to get zero divided by zero. So we have to use L'Hopital's rule on both of these limits right here. So if we do that, we're going to get two pi i times the limit as z approaches e to the i pi over 6, so that's our first limit. We're going to differentiate the top and differentiate the bottom. Differentiating the top, we're going to get a 1, and then over 4z cubed minus z, actually just 2z like so, because that's the derivative of the bottom, then plus the limit as z approaches e to the i pi over 5 pi over 6 of derivative of the top, that's just 1, over um, the derivative of the bottom, that's 4z cubed minus z 2z, like so. That's our second limit. Okay, now notice that if we plug each of these poles into these expressions right here, we're not going to blow up or anything, so we can just sub it in. So we don't need to use L'Hopital's rule again. So now we have 2 pi i, and then subbing at each of these in, we're going to get 1 over 4, and then e to the i pi over 6, but the whole thing cubed, minus 2 e to the i pi over 6, like so, and then plus 1 over, um, we have almost the same thing, so 4 e to the i 5 pi over 6, cubed minus 2 e to the i 5 pi over 6, and notice one thing right here, we have a factor of 2 right here, which can cancel out with some things right here, so this is really the same thing as pi times i uh, times 1 over 2 right here because 4 divided by 2 is 2. Now e to the i pi over 6 to the third power. We can just multiply these powers together to get e to the i pi over 2 and then minus, well this 2 is going to cancel out over here, so minus e to the i pi over 6 plus 1 over, this 4 is going to cancel out to a 2 and then same deal over here, multiplying these two powers together, we're going to get e to the i 5 pi over 2. And then minus, um, this 2 is going to cancel out over here, so e to the i 5 pi over 6. Okay, and now notice that this right here, e to the i pi over 2, that's exactly i, because we're just rotating 90 degrees anti-clockwise. And same deal over here, we're going 5 pi over 2, so a full revolution is 4 pi over 2, and then we're going an extra quarter turn, so that's also equal to i. Okay, now we're going to be using Euler's formula to kind of expand these, exponent, these complex exponential functions up a little bit, so this is 
um, pi times i and then now I have 1 over 2i minus now first of all we have the cosine of pi over 6 but the cosine of pi over 6 that's root 3 over 2 and then plus i times the sine of pi over 6 but sine of pi over 6 is a half so we're going to get minus 1 half like so and then plus 1 over you know, 2i right here then minus cosine of 5 pi over 6 that's minus root 3 over 2 and so in fact here we have a plus so plus root 3 over 2 and then minus i times the sine of 5 pi over 6 which is a half so here i also forgot an i right there okay so we're pretty close to finishing now we just need to clean things up a little bit here so now what is this going to give us we're going to get pi times i and then 1 over 2i minus half an i that's three halves of, of an i minus root 3 over 2 plus 1 over we have uh, same deal over here again we're going to get three halves of an i minus root 3 over 2 and we can multiply top and bottom by 2 um, we probably shouldn't cancel out that 2 from the other step but multiplying the top and the bottom by 2 we're going to get 2 pi i times 1 over um, 3i minus root 3 and then plus 1 over 3i minus root 3 like so and to believe this right here should have been a plus because our cosine of 5 pi over 6 was negative and we had to subtract it off so that should have been a plus so now from here let's try to combine these two fractions together and notice that the nice thing is these two are conjugate so when we multiply them together we're going to get a real number on the denominator which is quite nice so now we have 2 pi i times we have 3i plus root 3 so just cross multiplying everything and then so that's going to come over here this is going to come over here plus 3i minus root 3 like so and then this is divided by well let's just multiply those together that's the difference of two squares i believe so 3i times 3i that's minus 9 and then we have to subtract off root 3 times root 3 which is 3 so minus 9 minus 3 like so and oh, that's exactly minus 12 on the bottom and if we keep going we, we're going to have 2 pi i over minus 12 which is minus pi times i over 6 and then these root 3's will cancel out and then we have 6 i right here okay and if we multiply those 6 and 6 will cancel out i times i is negative 1 so we have minus pi times minus 1 and that's nicely equal to pi so pi is actually the result uh, we get when we take the contour integral over f of z dz on this contour right here but remember this integral that we started off with we showed that it was exactly this thing and this thing and this contour integral is equal to pi hence we've shown that our original integral just evaluates to pi in the end and that's quite a nice result so um yeah that's pretty much it for this video i hope you guys enjoyed it but uh yep up until next time have a wonderful day and i'll see everyone later bye bye